the human tragedy unfolding in Afghanistan has left national security practitioners and so many of around the world, so many of us around the world shell shocked to say nothing of the Afghan population, including me many who have risked their lives to aid American forces scrambling for safety as the Taliban has moved in over the course, moved in over the course of days. Today, we turn to two U.S. diplomats who have served on the ground in the region to provide much needed context and help answer the questions we all have. How did we get here and what happens now? Good afternoon and welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. This real-time report is part of a new series we've created designed to offer quick expert analysis on breaking news from around the world. We'll be doing these real-time reports on an ad hoc basis throughout the year as merited. And now all eyes are on Afghanistan. Former U.S. Ambassadors Michael McKinley and Ann Patterson are here today to help us sort through the developments of this last week. Don't forget to check out our website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events and keep an eye out for more of these real-time report webinars as they're announced. Ambassador Michael McKinley has managed some of the most sensitive U.S. embassies in the world as ambassador to Peru, Colombia, Brazil, and of course, Afghanistan. He has extensive experience with regional conflicts and peace negotiations, having played a central role in, in shaping policy decisions across three continents over three decades. He most recently served as senior advisor to the Secretary of State until October 2019, and now sits as senior counselor with the Cohen Group. I urge everyone to read his latest piece in foreign affairs titled, We All Lost Afghanistan. Am Ambassador Ann Patterson has also led critical U.S. embassies around the world. She served as the Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs from 2013 to 2017, having previously held U.S. ambassador roles in Egypt, Pakistan, Colombia, and El Salvador. She recently retired with the rank of career ambassador after more than four decades in the Foreign Service. In July 2017, she was appointed to the National Defense Strategy Commission, charged by Congress with conducting an independent review of our national security needs, and is the Kissinger Senior Fellow at the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Ambassador Patterson has a unique connection to our region, having attended the Hockaday School right here in Dallas. I know their discussion will help us sort through the events of the preceding days. So ambassadors, thank you so much for being with us. And I now invite you to take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here at the Dallas Fort Worth Council again, and I would I'm honored to do this. Uh, obviously, it's an extremely uh, timely topic, and I'm particularly honored to be here with Ambassador uh, Mike McKinley, who's not only his distinguished service in Afghanistan, but also in Latin America, uh, where he was considered uh, an absolute expert uh, in all things in our hemisphere. Uh, let me start off by just making a couple of observations and then asking uh, Ambassador McKinley to talk a little bit about how we got to this point, what he sees as the current dilemmas, and maybe importantly, how he sees the strategic implications of what has taken place in, in Afghanistan and indeed now in South Asia. My own view is that President Biden's decision was generally well received by the American public, at least initially. Uh, but the scenes of, at the Kabul airport, the speed of the government's collapse, the likelihood of Taliban reprisals, and frankly, what looks like the sheer incompetence of it all, at least in the last uh, few days, is obviously damaging. Uh, to the U.S., not to mention the Afghan citizens who are fleeing the country. Um, there seems to have been little effort initially to rally countries in the region around a plan, and this was one of those rare instances where, where their interests coincided uh, and perhaps could have been mobilized more effectively or to mobilize uh, the, the various factions and government inside of Afghanistan 
to produce some kind of settlement. I know that things moved uh, very rapidly. Um, so I would like to ask Ambassador McKinley to say a few words. I will, I will as I see questions in the, in the Q&A uh, function, I will ask uh, Ambassador McKinley if he would like to answer those as we go through the various issues, uh, particularly raised in his article. I, I thought his article had some really good insights into what had taken place in the past 20 years, over the course of the past 20 years, but what assumptions, at least in the last few weeks, were flawed uh, and led to this uh, uh, current, uh, this current uh, debacle. And Master McKinley, would you like to proceed? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Patterson. And uh, you know, before starting, I would just like to return the compliment and uh, Ambassador Patterson is somebody I was looking up to in my very first few years in the Foreign Service. And uh, it, she had a, a, a really strong reputation among younger officers coming in at that time. At that time, I was somewhat younger. And uh, her track record, uh, frankly, uh, intimidates me and covers uh, three continents uh, uh, like mine does. And uh, her work on national security questions, I think, uh, is very helpful with the topic we're about to address now. And to everybody in Dallas, I have two relatives in Dallas, and I spent a couple of years growing up in uh, the rival city of Houston, and, uh, but ended up uh, with the Dallas Cowboys as my team from 1966 onwards. And I haven't changed. So um, the other uh, aspect of our conversation today, which I think we need to keep front and center as we talk, is the absolute tragedy of what we're seeing on our screens. Uh, the, uh, we can get into the discussion of did it need to happen the way it happened, but uh, the human cost of the last few days and the fear of tens of thousands of Afghans and frankly millions of Afghans, uh, the uncertain fate of millions of girls and women in the country, the future of what was built in the country in terms of a free press uh, parliament with broad representation of the ethnic groups of the country. Um, as I mentioned, educational strides on a significant scale. Um, all of that uh, is in question right now. And I would add a personal note, which I know is shared by Ambassador Patterson. So many of us who worked in the region and worked in Afghanistan are being approached by Afghan colleagues we had, people we knew and worked with, desperately asking for help. And it's driving home uh, just how close and central Afghanistan has been to American realities over these last 20 years. And we see it all across this country. In terms of the strategic questions and issues we're facing now, this is a very ugly week in terms of the mood, not just what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan, but the political debate we're seeing in what's called inside the beltway with our Congress, with our media commentators, um, and, and obviously uh, the White House and the administration. And the language may even become uh, more violent in the coming days, depending on what happens on the ground. But I think it's very important to take a step back at this moment and remember that this has been 20 years of American engagement in Afghanistan, 20 years of American sacrifice in Afghanistan, a trillion dollars of expenditure, 2,400 dead Americans uh, in uniform, thousands of contractors who died as well, over 20,000 Americans wounded, tens of thousands of Afghans who have died, including tens of thousands of uh, Afghan military personnel and uh, civilians. And uh, it's important to remember that we went there for a reason and uh, we tried to do certain things across those 20 years uh, for a reason. And as we look back, the rationale was responding to 9-11 
and a very quick response was generated with the full support of the US Congress, the American public, and indeed the world. And in the early years, um, the purpose became a dual objective, not just chase down the remnants of Al Qaeda and uh, to keep the Taliban at bay, but to build a new Afghanistan and transform the country, nation building in the parlance of many. And I think across those 20 years, a lot of mistakes were made. They were made in how we approached the Afghan security force build out. We overlooked weaknesses, which may be are much more evident now in hindsight. Uh, we were less successful on some of our development uh, projects and priorities than we thought we would be. We misread Afghan political realities. It uh, remained a country that was very fragmented with regions, ethnic groups, uh, with very different perspectives on what should happen. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of corruption and self-interest, which undermined a lot of what we tried to do. And most critically, we underestimated the Taliban. So while by 2011, when bin Laden was found and killed in Pakistan, the threat of terrorism from Afghanistan to the United States was greatly diminished and diminished further still in subsequent years. Fact is the Taliban never went away. And from 2005 onwards, demonstrated themselves to be a political movement with support inside the country. And despite a surge which had over 100,000 American troops there between 2009 and 2011, they continued to strengthen also on the battlefield. And across most of the last decade, as US forces uh, uh, were drawn down across many years, not just this year, the Taliban uh, gained incrementally and certainly was positioned uh, to be more of a challenge to the government. And that was when President Trump made the decision to negotiate a withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan with the Taliban uh, in uh, the uh, 2019 uh, period. And uh, that agreement ended up being weaker in terms of conditionalities than it might otherwise have been. Withdrawal began and uh, was completed under uh, President Biden. Um, as we look at the scenes we're seeing now, I think there's legitimate questions that can be raised about the short timetable proposed by the administration, whether there was uh, enough planning going into addressing evacuation of Afghans who are at risk or who had worked with us and uh, in terms of recognizing what weaknesses were inherent in uh, the Afghan uh, government and security forces uh, as we planned our departure. But I'm happy to discuss any of these in greater detail going forward. A final opening uh, point, a lot of uh, concern now about what this does to the US position in the world, but I'd like to suggest that while this is extraordinarily damaging to uh, uh, Afghanistan and the Afghan people, and it has repercussions in the Central and South Asian region, uh, the world is a vastly changed place from where it was in 2001. And the United States is taking on new challenges from uh, rebuilding our alliances in Europe, in East Asia with Japan and Korea, uh, taking on the challenge of an emergent China, uh, dealing also with a resurgent Russia in a European context, taking on the challenges of new technologies, new economies, pandemics um, like COVID, uh, climate change questions. In other words, we're dealing with a global landscape with uh, very serious issues um, in which the United States still plays a critical leadership role. And the uh, setback debacle in Afghanistan uh, is not necessarily going to determine whether the United States uh, retains a leadership position in the coming years. It's our own will to engage with the wider issues of the globe that will do that. We have several questions and, and some of them are on Pakistan and let me put that aside for a minute, but let me, let me give you this question. Uh, some commentators have stated that the war in Afghanistan was lost when George Bush did not use US troops to defeat the warlords, but instead shifted the focus to the invasion of Iraq. What are your thoughts about that uh, uh, proposition? Well, um, I actually do think uh, if we take this, if not year by year, 
period by period, not necessarily presidencies, but um, that early period uh, from late 2001 through 2005, there was a very deliberate decision not to send a large American force to Afghanistan. Um, I like to think that the belief was that because the Taliban folded so quickly and Al Qaeda dispersed quickly, even though bin Laden was not captured or killed at that time, the assumption was that Afghans would be assuming leadership for their country and building out the institutions that had been hollowed out by five years of Taliban rule between 1996 and uh, 2001. There was also an underappreciation of the Taliban's uh, capacity to survive and uh, to rebuild in those years. Um, and there was one other factor at play, which was uh, within the Bush administration, there were key actors who decided Iraq was the big picture issue, not Afghanistan. And uh, it's easy to forget these days the, uh, the, 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 the famous speeches about axis of evil with us or against us, but the focus was very much on the United States would now remove threats which uh, could affect the homeland. And uh, Iraq was seen at that point as very definitely a bigger threat because of perceived presence of nuclear and chemical weapons in that country and potential destabilization of American security objectives in the Middle East. And so with the distraction of Iraq after that conflict began in 2003, um, Afghanistan definitely was neglected. And there were, uh, we did not commit to the security build out in Afghanistan on the scale we should have in the early days, early years when the Taliban was on the defensive. We didn't commit the resources to building. If we were gonna do nation building, um, it, it, there was certainly much more required than was applied to the country in those early years. Um, you know, if you go back and look, we're talking about a billion, two billion dollars a year in what was then probably the poorest uh, country in the world with 30 million people. And uh, the recognition that these, this assistance wasn't being provided and that the Taliban was making a comeback led to a change in our posture in Afghanistan in 2005, especially uh, 2006, 2007, when our troop levels started going up to 20 and 30,000, and there were uh, more serious efforts at assistance on the nation building front. But I would suggest that was rather late in the day. A related question, I think, to that, Ambassador McKinley, is, is uh, 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 one about our continued failure at nation building and inability to adjust our strategy is a result of political pressure, is it a result of structural bureaucratic issues, is it a result of overconfidence on the part of military leadership, uh, is it something else? I posit, as you suggested, sometimes it's resource constraints and frankly not knowing the terrain, but, but what's your view on sort of the, the main constraints on that, uh, and not just in Afghanistan, you have lots of experience elsewhere in the world. So um, I'm actually of the mind that it is possible to do nation building of sorts, uh, but it depends very heavily on the conditions inside the country. And uh, in the case of Afghanistan, it really was a misreading of what the country was about. There are persons in this country um, who know the place much better than I do, culturally, politically. Um, and I would refer everyone to a new book that's come out by Carter Malkazian, um, which uh, speaks about the war in Afghanistan. But the critical issue is uh, Carter, uh, both of us know, um, was is a Pashto speaking American, spent years in Afghanistan, was a senior advisor to our four star generals uh, in Afghanistan and has a profound understanding of the country. And in the book posits exactly what Ambassador Patterson has raised as a question, which is, did we understand what we were dealing with? And of course, what he lays out in nuanced terms is we tried, but didn't necessarily succeed on a number of levels. And so my top line areas where uh, we misread the situation. I already uh, mentioned one, which was 
the strength of the Taliban and the fact they had popular support, the fact that they were a terrorist organization, which they uh, were and have been until recently, um, if, uh, the uh, fact that they were a military insurgency, uh, which uh, they still are up to uh, this point in time, um, uh, people tend to put it aside, but they were also a political movement with an ideology and with support inside the country, not a lot, but enough to keep them going. And uh, so uh, I think uh, only belatedly uh, was that recognition accorded over the last several years. And um, a second issue was as we helped draft or pushed a constitution on the country which established a strong central government in a country that's historically decentralized where regional leaders carry weight, where Kabul is a symbolic um, sort of uh, seat of government in many ways. Um, we, we helped sort of create tensions that were already there. We didn't create them, but uh, uh, sorry, uh, reinforced tensions between regional leaders and the uh, central government, which had the virtue of having the resources because the assistance to the country was flowing through the central government and efforts uh, by multinational, sorry, by uh, donor agencies and international assistance agencies that worked through the government, even as they tried to work uh, locally in different parts of the country. So those tensions uh, were very evident uh, indeed. The other uh, factor at work, I think, is underestimating what the impact of 40 years of war is. Um, this didn't start with us or with 9-11. Uh, um, from 1979 to 1989, a war against the Soviet occupation in which five, seven million Afghans were, uh, became refugees, and the largest refugee population in the world uh, up to that point and for many years uh, after. A, a country that was ravaged by war and then by a civil war in which Kabul was the capital was reduced to rubble and then the Taliban come in and then uh, there's uh, the collapse of the Taliban in an effort to rebuild the country but the insurgency picks up steam and people begin to die again. Uh, we underestimated sort of what all of that meant in that context as we approached uh, building out uh, security forces and building capacity uh, to respond uh, to the Taliban insurgency. But most of all, I think we underestimated um, <clears throat> lack of governance and corruption. And uh, that's something we have to keep in mind. I don't think nation building fails every time, but we haven't done so well, for example, in Haiti, where we spent uh, $13 billion, I think, since 2011. And there's still question marks there. <clears throat> We've done better in other places that I've worked. Uh, like Mozambique after a protracted civil war there. But uh, the country, when I lived there, was one of the five poorest in the world and trying to negotiate a uh, peaceful accommodation between the insurgency and the government at that point. Uh, but it largely worked until recently. Uh, and Colombia, which Ambassador Patterson and I are both familiar with, which I would suggest is our single most, <coughs> sorry, uh, important success in uh, dealing what at one point was considered a near failed state. Um, and I wouldn't want to put it on the United States of, that we did nation building there, but working with the Colombians came out in a much better place than Colombia was in the late 1990s. So, so Ambassador McKinley, we have several questions that fundamentally go to the president's decision. And I, I think it's probably important to discuss that. Um, What's your view? And, and I, let's perhaps discuss this. Would our remaining force of 2,500 troops been engaged, re-engaged in combat with the Taliban if we hadn't left on the timetable? And a related question is, is why did we let so much valuable military equipment uh, fall into to, to Taliban hands? And then the question on the unconditional withdrawal how could have we have withdrawn in a more, I think, ideal, the questioner says, or a more structured way as this move forward? But the fundamental question, I think, is do you agree with the president that, that the 2,500 troops that were remaining there would have been attacked again by the Taliban uh, if, if he had not made the decision? 
Let me start off with saying that I was uh, privy to some of these discussions with the uh, Obama administration in 2009. And uh, then Vice President Joe Biden, frankly, was the only voice, really the only determined voice, uh, that the surge of troops uh, in Afghanistan uh, should not proceed. He then argued for a small uh, counterinsurgency force to remain in Afghanistan. This is more than 10 years ago. But, but the vice president's views, now the president's views on this issue have been well known for many years. So I suppose it's most assuredly not a surprise uh, that he moved in this direction, but I'd be very interested in Ambassador McKinley's views. The um, and 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 uh, that I think is a, a very important commentary you've just offered on uh, where the vice president now president has been uh, for the entirety of the past decade, and I certainly uh, witnessed his point of view as well when I was ambassador in Afghanistan. That said, um, one of the critical elements which I think is not coming into focus at the moment, and maybe it can't because of the scenes we're seeing um, across this week, is that the Taliban was gaining ground uh, pretty steadily for the last seven or eight years. This wasn't a new phenomenon. And so even 100,000 plus US troops, I think it was 102,000 at its height, plus uh, 30,000 plus coalition international partners, uh, European partners uh, in particular, did not really have a permanent impact on the fighting capability of the Taliban. And we can debate whether President Obama's decision to bring troops out after only less than two years of the surge was the right one, but I would suggest given our experience in other conflicts that we can think of, that extended engagement by US forces uh, in a foreign war in which there's not a clear cut enemy and particularly one that isn't engaged in pitched battles uh, doesn't necessarily produce the results you think it will, but it does lead to a lot more Americans getting killed. And the decision starting in the Obama administration, but going through the Trump administration and to the Biden administration was to draw down forces. As those forces were drawn down, and I don't want to put the Taliban advance on the drawdown of forces because at different points, 2013, 14, 15, 16, there were still 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 troops available. And if you add coalition forces, uh, more than that. Um, but the fact is, the Taliban is making gains, particularly in rural areas, particularly in Western and Southern um, Afghanistan. And so the suggestion that American troops staying at 3,500, 4,500 plus seven or 8,000 coalition partner forces uh, with the capabilities in terms of uh, intelligence support, in terms of uh, air support, uh, would make a critical difference to what was already a battlefield that was shifting in the direction of the Taliban? No, I don't think so. And, uh, the, uh, and, and, and the evidence is there in terms of the battlefield. The uh, issue then became as American forces um, uh, continued to draw down, what to do about the agreement which had been negotiated under the Trump administration in which there was an agreement reached with the Taliban in February of 2020 for a one year departure timetable from May 1st, 2020 to May 1st, uh, uh, 2021. And in which before the change of administration, US forces were already down to 2,500. With what I've said earlier, I would suggest that that force would not have made a material difference uh, to the eventual outcome we're seeing. It might have made a difference to the timetable if US forces were heavily engaged in the fighting over the last two to three to four months, but we weren't involved in that fighting. Um, going back a couple of years, in terms of whether uh, the Taliban would have begun attacking US troops again, absolutely 100%, they would be going after our diplomatic mission, we'd be having uh, losses 
And I will put my hand in the fire that the commentary at that point would be, why are we in Afghanistan? Why are American uh, men and women dying in Afghanistan? And uh, you know, what is the exit strategy uh, that we need to have there? But this idea that because no Americans have been killed, no American forces had been killed over the last year, or the Taliban were never going to attack again, simply doesn't hold water. They made a calculation on what it would take to get foreign forces out, particularly American, and they stuck to that calculation. And uh, the uh, president made a decision that he was going to continue um, to implement uh, what President Trump had negotiated. I think there's still a legitimate argument to be made over whether the timetable for that withdrawal of the 25, 3,500 was uh, too short. Um, I personally think it was, uh, even though I fully supported uh, the president's decision on uh, the withdrawal and uh, that it shouldn't have happened before the fighting season was uh, concluded. Um, and uh, that a little more time would have allowed for us to plan for evacuations, special immigrant visas for the people who had helped us, and frankly, for a more orderly turnover of facilities um, to the Afghan military. Uh, uh, we saw what happened in Bagram, the big American air base in the country where it was left in the middle of the night and vandalized. Um, so I don't think that was in people's calculations as uh, they set the original timetable out. But we can debate the timetable. I don't think we can debate the outcome. On the equipment, anybody's guess. Um, my sense, and I don't know, I'm reading the news like the rest of you, I'm not in the administration, uh, the, uh, is that a lot of the air assets are sitting at the airport and presumably something will be done with them. But it's pretty um, clear because we saw it happen in real time that a lot of the weaponry of the ground transport uh, did end up falling into Taliban hands as government forces either surrendered, um, retreated, or deserted. So, so there's a related, Mike, there's a related question to, to this, and 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 I'll, let me say a couple words. If the current exit strategy is a flawed one, what would have been a better exit strategy? And you talked about some of that uh, in your last response. But but my view was yes, of course you needed more time. That that struck me as just just sort of insane to, to push ahead with that time limit. And you needed more time because, because what struck me, there was, there was no sort of diplomatic muscle put into this. Now, maybe it was whistling past the graveyard in any, in any case, but there was no effort to, that I could discern to bring together countries in the region to force uh, Ghani to take steps to make some kind of settlement. All the prisoners were released and apparently immediately returned to the to the battlefield. So at the very least, you would have required more time uh, and not to leave Bagram in the middle of the night, which was a national embarrassment, I thought. Um, so that would be my view. Even if you agree with the president's decision, the implementation was deeply flawed. The, um, and uh, you know, you've, you've, you've made all the right points. And uh, the uh, only caveat I would offer is that <clears throat> implementation of the withdrawal agreement had begun early in 2020. That is under the previous administration. So we can't look at what happened this year in isolation. Some commentators have suggested, well, Biden administration could simply have reversed um, the steps that had been taken by the Trump administration. And clearly the decision was not to, but to suggest that there wasn't already a very considerable drawdown already in place by the time President Biden took office, I think um, is, 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 is not correct. I, I would suggest just one other caveat. There was an effort um, under the previous administration and this administration to rally regional governments to support what were supposed to be peace talks between the government and the Taliban. And so Gulf countries were brought into the mix. Um, we saw Norway, historically a country that has helped uh, in sensitive negotiations, very directly engaged. We saw European governments choosing to meet with the Taliban uh, to reinforce the importance of moving ahead with the peace process. 
you add the Russians and the Chinese uh, in their own way, and uh, it is very much their own way, uh, suggesting and trying to reinforce a peace process. They weren't sitting there thinking that, oh, two months later or a, a year later, the Taliban uh, would be occupying uh, Kabul. But the fact of the matter is, once the announcement was made on the withdrawal, uh, the air seemed to go out of the balloon, not just in terms of morale inside Afghanistan with the armed forces, although I would suggest that was already happening, not in terms of how the Afghan government pursued things, um, which I believe also was already a fact. But internationally, um, there simply wasn't the mobilization that might have been helpful in terms of commitments to the Afghan state, establishing conditionalities, and a much more rigorous effort to try to influence Taliban attitudes. But I'm gonna defend as a former diplomat, um, you know, the intricacies and complexities of uh, dealing with uh, fast moving events. We can criticize the intelligence and the fact that people are saying now they did anticipate <clears throat> the speed with which this all happened. Well, that's a fact they, that many people and people in critical positions and Certainly some of the intelligence that was being offered did not foresee this happening uh, with the speed it did. In March of uh, 2021, that's not that long ago, the intelligence agencies in unison were predicting that the government could hold out two to three years. Um, and all of a sudden by June, it was down to six months. And now we've seen this uh, descent cable by people at the embassy suggesting uh, it was much going to be much more much quicker, but they were reading events as they happened. So what I want to suggest is no one was moving ahead with the withdrawal plan, thinking we're gonna we're gonna bring down the government quicker. Um, it it this this thing simply uh, caught people by surprise, and then scrambling to respond. Well, uh, it, it was it was uh, it, it it didn't work. Um. Mike, let me let me. There, there are a number of questions on the on the region the, and what I would call the spillover effect and and on Pakistan, but not just on Pakistan. And uh, let me let me sort of start to introduce the topic of Pakistan in this. I, I think the spillover effects are really quite worrisome. Um, and whatever you may say about Pakistan's role previously, the fact that the the Taliban have taken over in Afghanistan is not in their interest. Pakistan now has very little leverage on the Taliban because of course the Taliban have won and control territory. But I think this threat of the Afghan Taliban tying up with Pakistani extremists is fairly considerable. I also think the refugee flows into Pakistan and Iran and neighboring countries, even Turkey, have the potential to be quite destabilizing. Uh, and then you get into issues like narcotics, uh, which are spread throughout the region. And we spent $8 billion trying to get rid of with absolutely no success. And then Afghanistan as a, as a location for great power competition, particularly with the Chinese as they move into Afghanistan. But I would be very interested. I think the spillover effects, we should start to focus on those. I think the evacuation will settle down. I think the American armed forces will get control of the airport. I think all that will settle down, frankly, fairly quickly. But the spillover effects into the region could be quite long lasting. And would you like to comment on that? Well, and, uh... And, and frankly, with your experience and broader knowledge of the region, I think you've uh, laid this out um, as, uh, uh, as, as an environment, which I think we're going to have to focus on for a long time, uh, precisely because of the spillover issues you're highlighting. I know that uh, many point to Pakistan as providing the sanctuaries which allowed the Taliban to prosper over 20 years. But as Ambassador Patterson has pointed out, it doesn't follow that they're interested in having it, uh, the kind of government that was in uh, Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001. And they're not particularly uh, pleased to see what's happening now, although they are certainly, given the proximity and more, more, and, and more importantly, 
uh, the overlap of Pashtun populations. There's more Pashtuns, uh, I seem to remember, in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. They're certainly going to be much more focused on how to build a relationship with the Taliban than others might be. But Pakistan has suffered terribly from terrorism, uh, homegrown, but also uh, international terrorism over the last uh, 30 years. And uh, certainly uh, we'll be looking to see what a uh, new government in uh, Kabul means for uh, security equations in the region. More broadly, um, Iran, uh, not our friend, um, and uh, certainly seemingly pleased with the uh, turn of events, not a friend of uh, unstable Afghanistan. Uh, my, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they have two to three million uh, Afghan refugees in the country. More importantly, um, Iran's one of, with Russia, one of the two great destinations for um, Afghan opium and heroin. And uh, Iran has a tremendous heroin problem uh, that, uh, uh, that they see as emanating from their proximity uh, to Afghanistan. In Central Asia, um, there is uh, very definitely among several of the governments uh, a, a fear that an extreme movement like the Taliban taking over uh, will uh, be an incentive for smaller movements inside their own country that are also violent uh, to become more active. And so a uh, real concern. More broadly, Russia and China share those concerns. And Russia and China, it's fascinating to me. Uh, maybe not so much to others, but Foreign Minister Lavrov of Russia last week suggesting to the Taliban they would be withholding recognition um, and waiting to see how the Taliban made its good on its commitments uh, to uh, not support terrorism. He didn't word it quite that way, but that was the message. Chinese, with their concerns in Xinjiang, um, also delivering similar messages, although not as openly uh, to the Taliban. And so all eyes are on Afghanistan. What I do, and uh, oh, I should add one other uh, very important actor, and that's India. And India, um, it, whether, whether we see it that way or not, uh, from Delhi's point of view, uh, the return of the Taliban is uh, giving Pakistan reinforcement. And so India views this as another very critical piece in the power relationship it has with its neighbor. More broadly, however, I would like to suggest that the idea that uh, China and Russia are gonna rush in and uh, take control of Afghanistan's lithium deposits and iron ore deposits, uh, we spent 20 years talking about that and they didn't develop. Um, it's uh, economics um, uh, and, and business build outs are complicated issues. And I, I don't think Afghanistan is gonna become uh, the next uh, uh, big, big uh, you know, pawn in terms of uh, critical natu uh, natural resources uh, for the technology age. Uh, but the other factors I've mentioned are significant enough. And with tensions between Pakistan and India, our, the tensions with Iran writ large, um, the, uh, and, and, and frankly, uh, the perennial tensions in the Gulf area, Afghanistan's definitely going to continue to remain a factor and a focus for many countries. So, so, so Ambassador McKinley, if you look ahead on, some, on a couple of issues, we have a couple questions. One is, do you think the essentially vis-a-vis -vis women and girls, do you think the Taliban has moderated its views? Is there any indication the questioner asked that the Taliban's plans for ideological imposition are more or less intense now? And then from one of our students, uh, what's your perspective on the possibility of another civil war with the new northern resistance, uh, the uh, uh, Amarillo Sala in the Panjshir Valley? Will the Taliban be able to solidify control or will there be a new conflict and a new civil war? Those are uh, two very, very difficult questions. On uh, the future uh, for girls and women in the country and uh, the broader question of whether the Taliban has moderated some of its uh, positions on society over the last 20 years. <clears throat> I think I'm pretty subjective, uh, like many people. 
and uh, their track record is terrible and horrible. And uh, in the time I was there in certain areas, they continued to burn or shut schools for girls and districts they took over. That's only a few years ago. I left Afghanistan in December of 2016. And so this idea that there is this transformation in the movement, but we're gonna have to wait and see. They're saying the right things, girls should go to school. Um, I saw an interview, I don't know, remember what, on, on what network uh, with Taliban leaders, but they're talking about, yes, girls should go to school until they're 12 or 13. Um, it, that may be an evolution on they should never go to school, but I'd hardly consider that uh, a positive gesture towards uh, the rights of girls and women or of uh, the needs of a modern society. And so I am, uh, I am very skeptical, but we can't operate simply on the basis of skepticism. We have to see what the actions are and if there are opportunities that are there um, because the Taliban for different reasons are changing their behavior in some respects. Well then to protect the, the, some of the rights that have been uh, gained, um, engagement's going to have to be part of the equation uh, going forward. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, uh, very complex uh, issue right now. I would add there's a generational change in uh, the Taliban. And more importantly, all of them lived in Pakistan, big cities, um, and saw a different way of living. And uh, many of them lived in the Gulf, including some of their absolutely key leaders, Mullah Baradar arrived from uh, Doha, um, I think, this week. And so uh, they've seen things differently. They also know what it was like not to have money to run an economy um, and so on. So there's this anticipation that maybe there's changes. I'm trying to suggest let's be cautious, let's be prudent. Uh, the jury's very much still out on this. But if there are some changes, then that's going to ask some tough questions of the international community. Uh, do we keep our distance or do we try to engage a bit to try to protect some of the gains of uh, the past uh, 20 years? And I spoke so long on that, I forgot the second question. Um, it was uh, on girls and women. What was the other? What were, uh, yes, on, and on the, the possibility of civil war through. Uh, through uh, that's right. Uh, in, the the, um, in other words, what kind of opposition will they have? I think if, it, it, it's not what I think. Most Afghans do not support the Taliban. They, do, they are a political actor in, inside the country, but there are many other political actors and groupings and uh, a senses of identity inside the country. It doesn't follow that there's going to be an immediate um, military response to them. One of the most striking features of the last few weeks is that the old style warlords didn't respond. They didn't do it in Herat, where there was Ismail Khan. They didn't do it in Shebergan, which is where Vice President Dostum, uh, former Vice President Dostum had his base. They didn't do it, and this one surprised me more than any, in mazar sharif which was um, viewed as the most peaceful city and in many ways, most modern city in Afghanistan, but um, presided over by uh, a more modern warlord figure, Atta Noor, and not a shot was fired in Mazar Sharif. Um, by the way, there's plenty of uh, regions in the country and districts where there were local fiefdoms and powerful people who also made their deals and did not fight uh, with the Taliban. And so the suggestion that we're immediately moving into a civil war phase in the country, maybe, but um, again, I think the jury's out on this. People are going to watch and see the extent to which the Taliban actually open up space for others. It is extraordinary. The sight of Anas Haqqani, a uh, younger brother of the terrorist organization, the Haqqanis, who became part of the, finally merged with the Taliban officially, uh, or allied uh, officially with the Taliban just a couple of years ago meeting with former President Hamid Karzai and the putative leader of the North, Abdullah Abdullah, the former uh, number two uh, in the Ghani government. Um, what does that mean? We simply don't have indications yet uh, where that's taking us. 
Mike, there are a couple of questions on the humanitarian uh, situation and whether a famine can be anticipated. I must admit that when I saw, which I totally agree with the decision, when we froze all the Afghan assets, something like nine billion, I think, in the Federal Reserve System, uh, this means, and I saw this in Yemen and I saw this in Libya, it means that it's gonna be very difficult to make a payroll. Uh, in other words, I suspect in Afghanistan and in other developing countries, it go, this money is distributed through the central bank. Um, I, I don't doubt that the Taliban can generate revenue through smuggling and through narcotics trafficking and all so sorts of other things, but it doesn't help civil servants get paid. And if people don't get paid, they can't eat. The other, uh, the other issue is, is we were listening to one of our colleagues the other day saying that the, a number of the humanitarian organizations can still operate like UNICEF and that in, in most regions of the country, the Taliban have been pretty cooperative with humanitarian deliveries, mostly because they take advantage of medical care and food and that sort of thing themselves. So how do you see this, this going forward on the, on the humanitarian situation? And will humanitarian workers be able to get in there and, and prevent some kind of mass disaster? That's just a super question. And uh, we're really at one of those pivotal moments as we head into winter uh, in Afghanistan, which is very harsh indeed. And in a country that's uh, still primarily uh, has a rural-based uh, population, but the fact of the matter is donors provided somewhere between 70 and 80% of the government budget. In other words, it wasn't just everybody in the military who received their salary uh, through, uh, through uh, the support of the United States and the coalition. It was government workers and it was government workers down to uh, you know, provincial uh, level. Um, so provincial capitals, um, where there were government ministry offices, all of this was supported by financing from outside. Very little was generated inside the country in terms of a tax base or revenue. And so the Taliban are going to be headed into winter and wondering, how do you maintain a government, um, how, how do you maintain uh, a, a government structure? How do you pay salaries? If they're interested in delivering services, how do you do that? But most critically, um, the uh, international agencies are uh, important for dealing with humanitarian response and needs. And Afghanistan has never stopped requiring an element of humanitarian assistance, even in good years, even when agriculture works. And so uh, I think one of the toughest questions, and I saw an article, I think it was today, and maybe it was from yesterday, but um, some, you know, it was basically an article, I think in the Washington Post, I think it was today. Um, uh, USAID director, Samantha Bowers, going to be facing an absolutely critical question now of how do you engage on uh, these humanitarian needs for the population at a time when we're also looking to freeze the Taliban's ability uh, to use money for its own purposes. So very difficult decisions coming up. Finally, I, I think the two of us need to respond to a question, which is how did foreign policy experts get it so wrong? And I wanna, I wanna take a, a stab at that because, because what I saw when I was in Pakistan was an absolute, a profound fear in the US government that there was gonna be another attack on the United States. And that overrode almost every other consideration. And there was the, the person that put the, the uh, bomb in Times Square. And when we started to pull that back, we saw a much broader terrorist activity than we thought. There was the Afghan American who had trained in Pakistan who was gonna blow up the American, uh, the New York subway. There was an incident which Petra absolutely paralyzed Washington for a while where we thought a nuclear weapon had gotten in the hands of the, of the Pakistani Taliban. And these events came up, these, these reports, which were valid, came up sufficiently often that they reminded everyone 
of the tragedy of 9-11 and nobody, at least what I saw, I was there in Pakistan earlier than you were in Afghanistan, was going to take a chance that there was, they were gonna take all kinds of risk and do all kinds of maybe silly stuff, but they were not gonna take a risk that there was gonna be another attack on the US. So that would be my answer to, to that question. The, the, um, and I think, uh, again, you've uh, presented it um, with, with uh, the insight of, of somebody who lived those earlier moments. Um, I lived, lived them peripherally. I was working on refugee and humanitarian response in the aftermath of 9-11, but was uh, uh, some removed from the uh, political decisions. But I think we really do need to be conscious of the moment our country was living through and the fear of the threats that could emanate. And 9-11, I, 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 I don't know, you know, with the passage of time, but I don't know, it is still a shocking development, not just for the United States, but anywhere in the world. We can go through and do historical comparisons. This was an extraordinary event. And the fear that something like that might happen again drove a lot of the calculations. In terms of getting it wrong, I would just pause it one thought because I know we're up against it on the time. I see Liz uh, on the screen. Um, the uh, leave you uh, perhaps uh, with one thought. Was there an opportunity in Afghanistan, in Iraq, responding to Islamic State, where we could have, you know, made our statement, military or otherwise, and taken a step back without fully committing ourselves? to the nation building aspects of this or to try to redraw strategic maps. I'm in the camp of, yes, there was. Uh, I think Iraq should have been turned over to the UN immediately um, after uh, the, the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Um, we missed our chance and it became just an American issue. Of course, it was a war of choice by the United States as well. But these decisions to stay and to engage in nation building and to engage in redrawing strategic maps in South Asia and in the Middle East, um, cer certainly I think uh, uh, helped lead us to the, uh, work, to the points we see ourselves in now, not just in Afghanistan, by the way, but I would suggest Iraq where the Iraqis for some time have been asking for us to leave. Thank you both, uh, truly. What a wonderful, enlightening discussion. And uh, thanks for joining us and sharing your insight and expertise with our community. I now invite our community to consider supporting one of the resettlement agencies that operate in DFW in cooperation with the State Department listed on the screen here. Uh, the Council's International Visitor Program, which assists the State Department with, with foreign leader trips through Dallas, both virtually and in person, consistently works with these organizations. They are really the ground zero for refugees and those with special immigrant visas in our community, greeting and sheltering and assisting those new arrivals during their initial settlement in the U.S., uh, your efforts would go a long way as we welcome these refugees to our community. Thanks to everyone for joining us, and I wish you a wonderful weekend. Have a good evening.